my book on legal systems very different from ours, which came out of a seminar I taught at Santa Clara University every other year for many years. Uh, the basic idea of it is that all human societies face about the same problems, that they solve them in an interesting variety of different ways, and they are all grown-ups. And therefore, all of them should be taken seriously as possible solutions to those problems and as evidence of how those solutions work, what difficulties they encounter, and so forth. The microphone's not working. Got to hold it really close so it can distort my voice even better. Uh, and so we can learn from their ideas and their experiences. I can't summarize a book very well in 10 minutes, but I wanted to go over a little bit of it, focusing in particular on some of the ideas from other legal systems that might be useful and interesting for us. A few lessons. One of them that I found particularly interesting was the idea of marketable tort claims. You can't afford to sue the person who wronged you, so you sell your claim to somebody who can. This was an institution of saga period Iceland roughly a thousand years ago, which is why I like to argue that the American legal system is a mere thousand years behind the cutting edge of legal technology. Damages for suing the innocent. Given that courts make mistakes, Suing an innocent party might result in his losing, and thus is a probabilistic externality. You've done nothing wrong. I claim you've done something wrong because I want to collect damages. There's a 10% chance the court will make a mistake and convict me. Therefore, if I really am innocent, that's an externality of 10% of my costs. So the Potential solution is to have a rule which says that when the defendant wins, the plaintiff owes him damages. This is not the English rule that the plaintiff owes him for his court expenses. This is arguing that even if there were no court expenses, by imposing a risk of false conviction, you are imposing a cost. We can't collect that cost when you get convicted because we don't know you're innocent, so we do as a proxy when you are acquitted. The rule was a sixth the amount that had been claimed by the plaintiff in Pericles in Athens. So this is another example of an interesting idea out of a rather different legal system. I like to describe the Athenian legal system as the invention of a mad economist because it has got multiple ideas which are very clever ideas that would probably appeal to the kind of people in this room and might or might not work. Finally, I'd like to talk about what I found most interesting of the systems that I studied, what I refer to as feud law, which is a kind of legal system that is private and decentralized, has existed in a variety of societies, and still exists implicitly in modern societies. Let me say a little bit more about that one. The basic rule of feud law is that if you wrong me, I threaten to harm you unless I am compensated. And there are four problems that must be solved in order for that to work. The first problem is some reason why right makes might. You don't want to have a situation where it's profitable for me to claim you've wronged me, demand compensation when in fact you haven't. So any workable feud system, there has to be some reason why my, my threat to uh, harm you is more believable when you're guilty than when you're innocent. And how that is done uh, varies in different societies. The simplest version of a feud system I'm aware of is among the modern Romanichal gypsies, the largest uh, Romani group in England at present. And it's an informal feud system in which what basically happens is that if you have wronged me, I threaten to beat you up unless you compensate me. It's a small enough society so that our friends probably know whether you wronged me, share our set of informal uh, community norms, and therefore if you really wronged me, my friends will back me and your friends won't back you, and the other way around if you didn't. That's a very simple one, and I like to describe that as a primitive version of the Icelandic legal system of a thousand years earlier, where there was actually a formal court 
which gave a verdict, which then told all the bystanders who was or wasn't acting, acting correctly. Second problem you have to solve is the commitment problem. I threaten to harm you if you don't compensate me. You reply, well, in that case, I'll beat you up. Natural enough response to make. What keeps me from backing down? Uh, part of the answer is hardwired. We think of vengefulness as irrational but it is in fact a rational commitment strategy. The knowledge that if you wrong me, I will very much want to get back at you unless compensated is a good reason not to wrong me. So in that, that, is, that goes back before humans. I like to argue that private property predates our species because territorial behavior in animals is a primitive version of private property and it depends on the fact that after a particular fish or bird has marked its territory, when a trespasser comes on, he is committed to fight more and more desperately the farther into the territory the trespasser comes. And that human property rights are a much more elaborate version of that. But in addition to that, in human societies, there's also a strong reputational incentive because if after making the threat I back down, other people will know that I'm a safe target that I'm a wimp and they can wrong me. They can cut wood in my, in my forest or seduce my daughter without my taking any action against them. The third thing you need is a mechanism for protecting the weak. I've already described the Icelandic solution to that. Somebody wrongs me, I don't have the resources to prosecute the case. If I try to go to court, I'll get beaten up. But my neighbor, He's got four strong sons who went a Viking in their youth and lots of relations and allies, so I transfer my tort claim to him. He collects it, and if he's nice, he shares the, the, the money with me. But even if he doesn't, at least I've gotten retaliation against somebody else who therefore has an incentive not to wrong me or to compensate me if he does. Other ways in other societies. Finally, you need a way of terminating feud because the risk of this system, what people associate with the term few, but I think is not typically what actually happens, is the idea that uh, I think you've wronged me, I demand compensation, you refuse, I harm you, you say, aha, that harm was wronging me, I've got to retaliate, and it goes on and on. So you need a way of terminating feud, and the standard way of doing that is to have an arbitrator, to have some powerful person who many people trust. Both sides go to him and say, we'll let you decide this case. Now, if he decides against me, I can back down without looking like a wimp because you can only get away with wronging me if the arbitrator will rule for you and next time he won't. And if I don't accept the ruling, I've now got a new and powerful enemy on the other side, which I don't want to do. So that's a way in which feuds got terminated. I listed here the four feud systems that I describe in, the, in my book, in various chapters of the book, which covers lots and lots of different legal systems. Why is all of this interesting? Uh, it's interesting for a number of reasons. First, I think there is evidence that many existing legal systems were built on top of feud law. Uh, that's clearly true for Anglo-American common law. There is evidence of fossilized feud in Islamic and Jewish law. Uh, weaker evidence for Roman law, and so forth. Second, it is a real-world example of stateless law. When I wrote my first book uh, back 40-some years ago, I described a hypothetical future society in which law and law enforcement were entirely private. I now know that I was reinventing the wheel, that that was a modern, high uh, division of labor version of what has existed in a variety of societies. Finally, it still exists implicitly in many contexts. An earlier speaker said we needed a science of norms. Part of the way in which norms are enforced is by an implicit feud system where if you violate the norms, I then treat you badly. And for my prediction, since they insisted on a prediction, which I didn't want to offer because this isn't really prediction stuff, it is that Trump's interaction with China over trade looks an awful lot like feud in a system with inadequate mechanisms to terminate feud, no equivalent of the arbitrator, and therefore it will still be going on by November the 2nd of next year and possibly longer. Thank you.
Um, questions, responses from our panel. I think, knowing you, there might be some really interesting one coming up there. I guess um, uh, for me, what's interesting is to ask you what what you think uh, we should be deploying in in all of these things going forward, and uh, and actually how we what the mechanisms of change are because you know our legal system is actually very hard and very slow to change. Yeah, it's a good question, but I don't have a good answer. That, as I like to say, I'm a theorist because experimental work is too hard. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is to describe institutions that might be improvements in our system and hopefully other people can use those ideas to figure out how to implement some of them. Now one place you can implement things possibly is in arbitration because modern legal systems actually use a lot of arbitration and you could certainly imagine arbitrated contracts which specified that if I claim damages and the arbitrator rules against me, I then owe damages to the person I claimed them against. I am not sure if any real arbitration system do that, but you might consider it. And I think that in general, arbitration is one potential way around the rigidity of the legal system. All right, uh, one question from the audience. Is there any question card or someone wants to come here? Yes, Jillian. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, but I was surprised to hear you say that um, we might need an arbitrator with lots of power uh, so that people, because that's, that's going back to the state. I don't think it's actually that at all, and that's not what's going on, as you know, in medieval Iceland. The, the only public official was the law speaker who had only the capacity to make an announcement, this is or is not uh, what our rules require. Um, I think that's about coordinating uh, individual. So I was just surprised to hear you say that about yes. arbitrators well, being powerful. I was talking about solving a conflict between two states. And for the conflict between two states, I think you probably need an arbitrator that, that the states will. And my impression is that historically it did happen. No, that it, it, back, uh, I, I believe it was not uncommon in the 19th century where you had two countries with a disagreement that they sometimes would agree that some third country would arbitrate between uh, them. But, but in the international context, that's exactly where you don't have a super, uh, super powerful power. What you have is, again, the capacity to coordinate the rest of the rest of sure. the states. That's how the WTO works, for example. But, but in the Icelandic case, you didn't have a super powerful. You just had somebody who was a relatively powerful player in a society which didn't have a whole lot of inequality of power, though it certainly had some. But that's enough so that it gives me a legitimate justification for backing down if I lose the arbitration, and it gives me an incentive to do so. And I'm just saying I don't see that there is such a mechanism, and therefore they wanted a prediction. I didn't want to offer a prediction. <laughs> and the only thing I could think of that I was saying that was actually relevant to modern real-world stuff, though there's probably other things I didn't think of, was the idea that the trade negotiations look a lot like a feud, and the problem is that I don't think there's an adequate way of terminating. 